Welcome fellow entrepreneurs to the Entrepreneur Adventure Podcast, where we talk about Amazon Wholesale and how you can use it to build an e-commerce empire, a side hustle, or anything in between. And now, your host, Todd Welch. Welcome to another episode of Entrepreneur Adventure, and this is a fantastic one. We sit down with Kevin Sanderson today over at Maximizing E-Commerce, and he is a successful Amazon seller in the private label space. But what we're going to be talking about today is selling your products in other marketplaces such as Canada and the UK and the rest of Europe and how it can help you expand your Amazon business without a significantly amount more of work. You can expect going into these markets to get a 10, 20, 30 percent sales increase versus what you're doing in the United States. So if you're selling $100,000 in the United States, you'll probably do about 10,000 or so in Canada and maybe 30,000 or 40,000 over in the UK. So what would you do to be able to gain an additional 40 or $50,000 in sales a month, depending of course where your business is. Some of you are starting out in the beginning, so this is something to keep in the back of your mind. But if you already have an established Amazon storefront in the US, you definitely are gonna want to think about doing this sooner rather than later. I know I am, I just went into Canada and I'm looking at going into the UK and it's really gonna help boost my business without a significant amount more of work. So. Make sure you stay tuned for this one. Sit back, relax, and let's go ahead and jump into this episode with Kevin Sanderson. Today, we have a successful Amazon seller and e-commerce entrepreneur, Kevin Sanderson, joining us today. He really specializes in uh, private label and bringing products to other countries and other markets. So a lot of us are used to selling on Amazon.com but he's gonna to talk to us today about selling in other markets such as Canada and Europe. So Kevin, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your background. Awesome, well, I'm super excited to be here, Todd. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, this is gonna be a lot of fun. This is gonna be a lot of fun. You and I, uh, we met at Brand Accelerator Live. I think we'd met in the, uh, the, the forums before that. Um, yeah. We have a Facebook group for that event. So yeah, super excited to be here. So I guess the question of how did I get into e-commerce? So about 15, 16 years ago, I bought a uh, bought two Nike Four Woods golf clubs on eBay with the intention of selling them. And I did my product research at the time, which included going on Nike.com and looking and seeing the MSRP was about four hundred dollars. So I was like, okay, well that means I'm going to 10x my money if I'm buying them for forty bucks on eBay then I'm, I'm gonna be able to sell it at 10 times the price. Well, I bought them, I bought two of them, and it didn't occur to me to think about it until after the fact, what were people actually buying this for other than me? And pretty much consistently, everyone was buying the Nike Four Woods, which if you play golf, it's a very unusual golf club. And basically, everyone else is paying $40. So I was like, why is someone going to now buy mine for 400? So I did what a lot of people do, nothing. So one of them is still in the packaging and one of them is uh, around here somewhere in my golf bag collecting dust because I don't really play golf that much anymore. But that's how I first got into it. But then later on down the road, call it about 2015, I was working for a friend of mine's insurance agency and they were going through a period of rapid growth and I remember at the time thinking, you know, what? I'm working really hard for someone else's dreams and I was happy for them and their dreams and still I'm very happy for them. But it was one of those things I was like, if I'm gonna work this hard, it might as well be on my own dreams. So I started thinking about what do I wanna do? Um, you know, had a bunch of different ideas of what I thought I would do. And I'd been listening to podcasts for a few years doing nothing. And I happened to find the amazing seller podcast, Scott Volker. Um, which I think a lot of people on the private label side of the world have been doing it for a couple of years. That's how we got into it was finding his podcast. Absolutely. And I was like, okay, this makes sense. So this is kind of saying step by step what to do. So this was, let's say summer of 2015. I went to Walgreens and Goodwill and a couple other places, bought some stuff on clearance, 
send it into Amazon. And I remember the first day it arrived, I sold one of those little blue freezer packs. And like, you know, that you put in the freezer to keep your cans cool and your cooler. Mm -hmm. And like, I remember like starting my addiction that many of us have of like taking our thumbs and flicking it on the screen for our, uh, our seller app. Yeah, and you know, it's, yeah, exactly. That little slot machine feeling. And it's like, I'm doing, trying to figure out like, okay, is the slot machine going to show me anything? Zero, zero, zero. And all of a sudden one, wait, what, what, what what's it, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. It was like this rush of adrenaline of like, oh my gosh, now all of a sudden I've made a sale. So I go running into the living room and I show my wife, I was like, you have to see this. And she first thought I was like crazy. Um, then she realized I was just excited. So after that, I was hooked and I've been hooked ever since. And I basically took a, a season's worth of earnings as a high school football official that fall and invested that into my first uh, private label product. And then what I did was just kept reinvesting for about three years. And about a year ago, I just left my job and now I'm doing this full time and um, basically sell on Amazon in the US and eight international marketplaces. And it's just a wild ride and I love it. And, uh, you know, you and I were talking off camera and I'm my, my I don't want to say my hope or my goal is I will um, also expand my offerings into wholesale as well. So awesome. I'm excited about yep. that. Yep, that'll be, it's wholesale is excellent. Definitely something you want to get into. Uh, personally, I think the risk is a lot lower than any other channel or way of selling on Amazon for sure, because you're selling other people's products who are, that are already successful for the most part. So you're just kind of jumping on there and selling more. But what I love about your story there is, well, number one, you didn't give up after the golf clubs, which... You definitely could have, and a lot of people do, unfortunately. But uh, I like that you you basically got another job. Um, I'm sure it was fun for you, refereeing. You probably enjoy mm -hmm. that. But you took the money from that, put it in the business. And one key there, everybody, if you're listening to this, three years it took before he went full time. So this is not any kind of get rich quick scheme. If anybody's telling you that it is, they're lying to you. It takes time. I'm in my third year and I'm just getting close to jumping off and going at this more full time. So it takes time to build up everything. So that's an important thing to remember. Don't risk your livelihood and your, the life you've built by jumping too early. Um, because once you start taking money out of the business, it gets harder to grow at the same time because now you're sucking money out of the business. So I think that's a really important point um, from your background there for people to keep in mind. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's one of those things like I think you're never truly ready. Eventually you got to pull the trigger. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I shortened my horizon of where I was looking to leave the job at some point. I was like, I'm just going to do it. Um, but at the same time too, to your point, like, you know, I didn't say six months in like, all right, I'm all in, let's just do it. It was, you know, it was still three good years of going into it. So yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's been a fun ride. Yeah. And, uh, actually this is the first time I'm really telling anybody about this. I told a few people on uh, one of the private groups I'm on, but last night my Amazon account actually got suspended. Oh, wow. Um, because I had a performance report that uh, I started listing a product that I ended up finding out was restricted. Um, it was a, an energy drink, which has been selling on Amazon for years, this exact same product. And I thought I'd be smart and make a three pack of it. Made my three pack, didn't even send anything in yet. And all of a sudden that listing went down. I got an email from Amazon that I'm trying to sell a product that has uh, DMHA it was called which apparently is not approved by the FDA yet and so they took down the listing and I had to submit a plan of action as to how I was never gonna run afoul of any laws or Amazon policies ever again in my life and oh, wow. I did that and I thought I made a really good plan but uh, last night they refused my plan shut down my account probably about 10 30 p.m. so right before I was going to go to bed 
So now I got to run to the computer and create a new plan of action. And I submitted it last night. And by the time I got up this morning, thankfully my account was reactivated. Oh God. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I was like, Oh my uh, gosh, this sales, is terrible. It's, it's something to keep in mind that uh, that risk is there. So if I was mm -hmm. depending on this for my income, I probably wouldn't have got any sleep last night. <laughs> oh so, no. It's, uh, there's always risks in everything. Uh, we're playing in Amazon's world, so we got to mm -hmm. follow their rules and everything like that. And I actually contacted a lawyer last night in case I was still suspended this morning and everything. So I'm not trying to scare anyone out there from not doing Amazon. It's mm -hmm. a major opportunity, but just keep these things in mind. Follow the rules and know that you know things can happen. Uh, just like anything, uh, any kind of business, things can happen. But uh, very true. Not to get too sidetracked on that, but I just thought I'd throw it out there because it's fresh in my mind and had my uh, heart racing a little bit last night. So yeah, you got my heart racing too, Todd. Wow. Yeah, for sure. So that wasn't fun, but lesson learned. Uh, definitely going to look a little closer at those kind of things going forward. Oh yeah. So now the company that you run uh, is maximizing e-commerce that mm -hmm. is your uh, e-commerce business where you're helping other people basically get started selling their products on amazon into different countries and things like that you also have a podcast so um, if you're out there and you're interested in that kind of stuff and adding another podcast go ahead and search for maximizing e-commerce it's really good I have it on my uh, subscription list and listen to it every time you put a new one out. So well, thank you. Highly recommend that. Um, but your specialty and what we're going to be talking about today is really helping people bring their products into other platforms. So why don't you give us an overview of that and we can get jump into that. Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. So one of the things I learned early on from my uh, 10 to 11 year blackout period from 04 or 05 until 2015, um, where I didn't do anything in the e-commerce world, even though I kind of started it. And the reason I say 04 or 05 is I've checked and my eBay account doesn't go back that far to tell me when I purchased it. But basically what I, I came to learn is, you know, everything is a function of time. So the more we can cast a wider net over time, the more results we're gonna get because we'll never get time back. We can always add more products, you know, add new wholesale accounts or, you know, add new channels or whatever the case is, but we'll never get more time. So early on, I was like, you know what, Amazon's going ahead, but, you know, still working on the snowball and still working on the snowball and the snowball is relatively small in the beginning. But it was one of those things where it was like, how can I make this go faster? So, you know, I listed my stuff on eBay, uh, create a Shopify store, and I'm getting very, very, very limited sales you know going that way in fact i remember the first ebay sale i made the person ended up getting a refund i, I haven't had that bad of uh, uh sales or luck on my ebay sales since then but i've had very few sales relative to what i've done on amazon one thing i learned quickly is if i just take my products and i list them in canada and send in some fba inventory to test it out i was getting way more sales in canada than I was in eBay and my Shopify store and now Etsy and all that other fun stuff. So I was like, okay, let's replicate this and go into the UK. So I went into the UK and as of the time we're recording this, we can send stuff into the UK and they'll ship it to Germany and Italy and Spain and or France, Spain, <laughs> France and Spain. Um, so I was like, let's, do that and then I added on Japan and I've added on Australia and it's like it's it's one of those things I just keep casting a wider net and it's it's definitely helped me a lot in uh, growing that business and so what has come into it and that's how maximizing e-commerce was born was I started finding I'd go to conferences and tell people like oh yeah I'm in you know all these marketplaces and that's all they wanted to talk about was well how did how do you do that? Like what forms do you fill out? Whatever. And you know, Oh, it seems so hard. And I'm like, well, it's sixth grade level math to figure out the currency differences. And, you know, don't give up on not having more sales just because you don't want to fill out a form, you know, that's no harder than, you know, getting a driver's license or a passport, you know, to register in Canada, for example. In fact, I've found the tax structure is actually for sales tax is easier in the other countries because it's usually just to, you know, the main government. 
and not to, I don't even think anyone really knows what we're supposed to do here in the United States because you talk yeah. to 10 different sales tax experts and they'll tell you something different. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, you ask them again and they'll probably tell you something different than what they told you, you know, the day before. So it's, it's one of those things. It's a constantly evolving thing here in the U.S. was there. It's much simpler once you kind of learn the, the roadmap. So basically, I now also help people in this. So I've done it myself and now I've helped others. So I'd love to you know, share with your audience how they, if they wanted to add on additional sales channel, they can do that in their business. Yeah, for sure. And I'm really interested in myself because I just right. started selling in Canada. Oh, cool. Uh, I've got a few products that are listed. I went through that process of completing the paperwork, mm -hmm. uh, which was not that hard. And in fact, yeah. uh, I jumped on the phone with the Canada uh, tax people or uh -huh. with the government there. And they actually asked me, you know, what kind of Amazon business I'm doing and stuff like that. Um, so they actually did they ask you if you're doing FBA on. or FBM? They did. Yes. And, it's, and they know those terms. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So it was, it was really good, really refreshing for sure. And so I worked through that, uh, myself personally, I'm not a, uh, big government guy. So anytime I have to deal with the government, I kind of <laughs> like uh, fighting gloves on, you know, but, uh, it wasn't really like that at all. It was really, yeah. really pretty simple and got it. Uh, I've got a prep center up there and I'm starting to send stuff in. The only thing is dealing with like duties and things like that. And shipping mm -hmm. is, is just as easy as shipping the U S but a little bit different. So yeah, why don't you go ahead and jump into that and kind of give us uh, uh, the overview of someone who maybe is selling uh, some products in the U.S. and wants to start selling in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. So I think Canada is the best place to start internationally. The reason I say that is it's like right there. You know, it's pretty close to the U.S. Shipping costs, if, you're, if you have products in the U.S., to send it into Canada is way less expensive than, you know, sending it across the pond by boat or by air, most likely by air. But either way, it's going to be a lot more expensive and it's a lot more complicated. That is like, we'll say varsity, um, to use kind of like a high school football analogy. Uh, that would be like varsity uh, sales tax, whereas GST, HST, the sales tax in Canada is like the freshman team. It's much simpler. It's one of those things like it's added on to the selling price, just like we do here in the U.S. And one of the nice things is, is you have to pay at the border generally to get your goods into Canada. And then actually Amazon charges you their sales tax, the GST, HST, on top of some of your fees. But you actually can take whatever you pay at the border and whatever you pay Amazon and GST, and you can subtract that from what you collect from customers. And so basically it's a credit. So you're basically getting that money back. That's one of the nice things is that's just something that we don't necessarily have in most cases with sales tax is like something where you can deduct out and pay less. So here that is something. So it's basically nice. like a deduction from your income, whatever income mm -hmm. you have from Canada. Okay. Sort of. It's on the sales tax side. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think what trips people up in getting started is two things. It's either the money stuff or the government stuff. And as you mentioned, the government stuff's not so bad. And at least with dealing with them, they're usually pretty nice in Canada. Um, yeah. There's that stereotypical friendly Canadian. And I'll say that. And sometimes Americans are like, oh, that might offend Canadians. No, like they're usually proud of that. Like they'll say thank you for saying that. Like and they say that so nicely and proudly. Yeah. But one of the things I've learned that, you know, with the government stuff, it comes down to really taxes. That's the part that really trips people up the most. And you have two buckets of taxes. You have sales tax and income tax. So income tax is whatever you make off of your profit. Well, that you, assuming you're in the United States, owe to Uncle Sam. You're going to generally pay it to your own government. And if you don't have a CPA or someone doing your taxes, have them help you. And they can figure this out. They've, you know, they've got a college degree in accounting. They've passed the CPA exam. They know what they're doing. They, they can handle, you know, another marketplace. Trust me. And then the sales tax is pretty much always going to go to whatever the local government is. And in Canada, if you are registered for GST, HST, which you generally should be um, in most cases, they will, um, Amazon will collect it from the customers and you just pay the, the government. And then that way you're also recouping what you paid in GST that you wouldn't have gotten if you weren't collecting. So that's 
pretty simple. And in Canada, you only have to file once a year for your um, GST, HST sales tax, which is nice until you have like a million and a half in sales. And if you have more than a million and a half in sales, Canadian dollars in sales, well, that's called a good problem to have. But now you have to file quarterly. But you've got plenty of profit to pay for, you know, more filings. Yeah. Um, you know, you know to have someone do it for you if you chose. Yeah. Or you could do it yourself. They're not even that complicated. Then the money stuff is what trips people up. Like, oh my gosh, it's different. Well, you know, whether it's Canadian dollars or euros or yen or British pounds, it's all just a basic ratio. My sister is a sixth grade or sixth grade. My sister is a principal at an elementary school in Texas, uh, K through six. And I asked her what grade level would be able to figure out if I said $1 in the U.S. is like, say, $1.3 Canadian. So $20 in the U.S. is how much in Canadian dollars? And she's like, oh, that's sixth grade. That's a basic ratios. So if you are smarter than a sixth grader, you can handle the money part. And, you know, calculators and spreadsheets, lots of ways to make this very simple of, you know, figuring out what the difference is. So if you're selling a product for $20, it's about $26, $27 in Canada that you'd sell it in Canadian, roughly. And you can play around. That's not a, you know, sometimes you can even get away with adding a little bit more because people are used to paying a little bit more in Canada because stuff generally more expensive is what I've come to learn. Not too much, but you know, you could add on another Canadian dollar or two just for good measure. And then what'll happen is you, you've got your registrations and whatnot and you've got the money part. Now you're comfortable. So now it's time to, to get started. So you register um, in Canada, it's called a form RC1 as in revenue Canada. And if you have questions like, you know, your experience, Todd, you can just call and they'll answer your questions. It's basically you're registering for GST, HST, which if you've done more than 30,000 Canadian dollars in sales, you technically are supposed to. So that's about $23,000 US. And what trips people up is that's worldwide sales. So your sales here in the US count to that. So for most people, when they go into Canada, they are in a situation where they need to register yeah. to be compliant. And I'd say, even if you're on the border, just like a, a threshold, you might as well, because you're going to pay money when you import goods into Canada and you're going to pay also pay money to Amazon on some of your fees. So you might as well recoup that out of, you know, what you're collecting from customers. And if you don't register, you can't, Amazon's not going to collect it. Yeah, for sure. So, and I'll put a link uh, down below to, uh, what was the name of the form again? Oh, RC1. RC1, so in the show notes. So this is going to be episode number seven. Um, so that'd be at entrepreneuradventure.com forward slash seven. So we'll have a link to that form, uh, link to your website and podcast as well. We'll throw in there. So yeah, it's not too hard. I figured it out on my own, uh, filling out the form and everything. Like I said, I jumped on the phone when I had mm -hmm. questions and they helped me figure it out. Uh, probably the biggest thing that I'm still trying to figure out is exactly how we should handle customs clearance. Oh, gotcha. Can you talk to about that a little bit. Are you mm -hmm. utilizing a broker or are you just letting FedEx and UPS charge you or how are you handling all that? I usually use UPS. So, and I think a lot of freight forwarders, really it's UPS that's doing it. They seem to be pretty big in the Canadian border of basically the way it works is goods go across the border. My understanding is the Canadian government says pay now. It's not like, Oh, we'll get a bill, whatever. Someone has to pay that. Yeah. So your customs broker, which if let's say it's UPS, they say, okay, we will pay on Todd's behalf. So then they come to Todd and say, here's an invoice. You owe us this money. And so Todd pays UPS. And he's now free and clear with UPS who already paid the money. Cause otherwise you'd have to literally go to the border and say, Hey, who do I give the money to? My stuff's here. Where is it? Is it that truck over there? Whatever. It'd be a mess. So just sign up for a custom broker. And the nice thing is if someone has never used UPS outside of Amazon, you know, they give us the, the super good rates, um, Unfortunately, those rates aren't available because Amazon doesn't want to get involved in going across a border. So if you're shipping stuff from the U.S. into Canada, you need to have your own shipping. And you could theoretically just go on UPS.com. I've come to learn through experience, and I have discounts on my UPS account. 
I still put in this promo code, either easy, E-A-S-Y, or fast, F-A-S-T. Like things aren't hard, they're easy, or not slow, but fast. So easy or fast, either one, should work. Um, it's worked recently, the last time I tried, and it's up to 40% off okay. shipping. And so that makes it a lot more cost effective. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned is if you miss a form, like let's say you have to have a commercial invoice. If you don't have the commercial invoice, chances are your local UPS that picked up the goods will say, we need this form, please send it to us. So you send it to them. Yeah. Or if let's say the first time I shipped it, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just like, here you go, UPS, take it. I didn't have a brokerage account for customs. Guess what they did? They called me and said, you need to fill this out right away. Okay. So I filled it out had it notarized, whatever I needed to do and send it back. Like, it's one of those things I've come to learn. It's their job to make sure stuff gets across. I think they have, whether they call them KPIs, key performance indicators or goals or whatever, of getting things across, a certain percentage of goods across and clearing it, that they look at it as their responsibility. Yeah. Um, Cause like, it doesn't help them to just ship it back to you and say, you didn't fill out the right form. They want it to get there. Yep, for sure. Yeah, so my prep center that I'm using in Canada, they recommended mm. me to another customs broker mm. uh, who would deal with the customs for me. I'm not sure. Mm. I have to look into it more. I'm not sure if they charge less than UPS, maybe. Maybe. Like on one of my last orders, it wasn't a big order. It was like sixteen or $1,700, but my import duty on that was uh, like about 5%. So that's the Sounds about right. fees that Canada charges us for allowing us to bring United States goods mm -hmm. into Canada. The customs clearance fee that UPS charged me was 6.83% of it. So it was actually higher Seems high. than what the import duty was, at least if I'm looking at the invoices right, because I believe the invoice was like 100 and $44. I'll have to double check. Does that sound high to you? Yes. One of the things I get tripped up on sometimes even myself, I have to double check the invoice to make sure I'm reading it correctly is which currency is it in? Okay. So is it sometimes like, is it on this column? Is it in us dollars or Canadian dollars? Usually they switch stuff over. If it's you as a us customer, they exchange everything into us dollars, but you just may want to check that. Usually I see an itemized um, dollar amount from UPS for custom brokerage charges, which sometimes flexes depending on the amount. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's one of those things your prep center saying, especially maybe for lower or smaller shipments or depending on scale. I mean, it's probably one of those things that's worth looking into. I've not looked into it. I'm, I guess, loyal to UPS or maybe they, you know, just heard from a customer that they like this other company better, but. Either way, you just got to get your stuff across the border and somebody has to pay on your behalf. Okay, good. Well, that's good to know. So you're not using one, so there's no absolute need. So they're probably just trying to refer business to someone that they work with, which is fine. Ooh. I'd do the same thing, but sure. uh, maybe they're cheaper. I'll have to dig a little bit deeper, but yeah. All right. So basically- If they are cheaper, let me know. I will. I will. Um, so basically, we've got our products that we're selling in the U.S. We filled mm -hmm. out the- forms for Canada to get mm -hmm. our uh, registration number up there. And now we've shipped our products into Canada. We've paid mm -hmm. the duty, which is the tax that Canada charges for importing products. And then we also paid the clearance fees, which is basically like the labor charge for whatever company is bringing the product in for you. Uh, what would be next after we get it across the border now? Yeah, after you pay the duties and GST, the GST is what's the, probably the 5%, and that's what you can recover. So make sure you save your receipt so that at the end of the year you can make that a deduction off of what you're going to pay Canada. But basically, list product. And you know, I, I know wholesale world, people don't do a lot of giveaways, but even if someone's listening and they do uh, private label or they do, um, they, they do uh, some giveaways either way in you know the u.s whether it's private label or wholesale generally people i've talked to say they've never had luck with doing anything those type of strategies in canada it's at most 
turning on PPC. Now, if you're on a wholesale listing and it's already getting sales, you're just adding yourself onto that listing. Yep. And one of the nice things is there's some hoops you have to jump through that we've talked about, like, you know, the brokerage account and the forum with Revenue Canada, and you had to call them and ask a question. Most people are listening to saying, well, intuitively, that doesn't sound that hard. But a lot of people will say, well, that's just too much. So I'm not going to do that. So guess what? There's less competition. So chances are you're probably competing with less people for the buy box. Um, and you're probably competing with, you know, fewer similar products for the keywords that people are looking for too. So it's a, yeah. it can be a very good thing. So Definitely. once you start getting the, the sales in, I was what's that? Say, most of the products that I'm starting to sell up there, mm -hmm. there are sellers on them, but their prices are like astronomically higher. So I'm assuming they're buying from the U S and then like just drop shipping it into the customer in Canada. Because most of them are like FBM sellers. Yes. So you'll find a lot of that, I think. Yeah. So if somebody starts looking at the product and it's like, let's say it sells for $20 in the US, well, using our math from our example of, we'll assume the currency exchange is one to 1 1.3, that's about $26. So, you know, if it's between 26 and 30 Canadian dollars, that's about right for where you'd expect it to be. You might look and see that for selling for 75 yep. Canadian dollars. And so don't think like, oh, wow, I'm just going to crush it. Like kind of like how I thought I was going to crush it with the Nike Forwoods selling them for $400. That's not going to happen. So what happens is uh, Amazon calls what you just described a gray listing. And what it is is there's bots who will go in and they will scrape like it could be a million listings in the U.S. and they'll list them all in Canada and, if, and they make them super high. And what they're banking on is like if let's say it's a popular product and you know whoever has inventory runs out and they get some one-off sale so they have a very 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 wide net and if just a handful of those a day sell then they've actually made decent money because they're selling it at such an astronomical price and they're doing exactly what you said they're buying it from the u.s and drop shipping it it's technically against terms of service although amazon kind of does that themselves sometimes yeah. but it's one of those things, never worry about it because if you have FBA inventory and you have a competitive price and you're going to get it to the customer, you know, or Amazon will be able to get it to the customer quickly. Who do you think Amazon's going to give the buy box? To? Yep. And I noticed on the one, the few items that I brought over there that had those kind of people on there, they basically disappeared off the listing after I got out. Oh yeah. It, so. Oh yeah. Cause they're not yeah, totally. in sales anyway. So, all right, yeah, perfect. Uh, now, are you direct shipping to Amazon warehouses in Canada or do you work with a prep center to ship stuff in? Great question. So for my private label products, for my own branded products, I send everything into North America into the US and then I divvy some of it up. I don't make a whole order just for Canada. I take parts of it and split it up. Now, what I do for Europe is I will say, like, let's say I'm ordering a thousand units. I might say I want 900 units to go to North America, send it to Florida. Uh, and I usually do some prep locally um, just because I'm kind of a control freak like that. And then what I'll do is I'll say the other hundred units will send into Europe. And I have a prep center I work with in um, the UK that does some labeling and polybagging and bundling and stuff like that for my own branded products. However, I know lots of people that send stuff directly into Amazon in just about every marketplace they are in. All right. It's just one of the things I would caution people to is make sure you get the right labels for the right marketplace because they're not always going to be the same. For sure. Yeah, I'm using a prep center. Uh, you know, obviously they're charging me an extra, I think it's like $1.25 per item to prep it mm -hmm. and get it ready. Um, but that way I can either have products shipped directly from the supplier to that prep mm. center and just kind of collect a good amount of stuff and then ship it out to the Amazon mm -hmm. warehouses rather than having to send stuff all over to different warehouses. I'm, I'm thinking it'll probably cost me less shipping doing it that way. Um, oh, gotcha. See. Yeah. It's one of those things. It's like, it's always worth trying out or seeing what works best for your business. Like I could probably save money if I sent stuff from China because most of my stuff comes from China directly into Amazon in Canada. 
but right now, knock on wood, I haven't been hit too hard with tariffs. So I've got the margins to play with and that way I kind of like controlling my inventory, but you know, there's all, depending on your supply chain, there's all kinds of ways you could do it. And so what you're describing, if it works for you, then absolutely do it. Send, you know, use the prep center. If it makes sense, then monetarily makes sense. It's just a game of margins. All right. Perfect. Yeah. So anything else you want to touch on that people need to know for Canada before we shift gears over to Europe? Uh, yeah. One thing to keep in mind is if you're looking at like Jungle Scout and things like that, keep in mind what you have in the U.S. on Amazon.com is a unicorn. And basically it's a magical place that doesn't exist anywhere else. So you could be looking on Amazon.ca and you might realize like, oh, but you know, it's only selling one or two units a day. Or is that, let's, let's say that's 10% of your sales. But if you start adding that up over a portfolio of products, you could be looking for another, you know, 10, 15% of your own sales there. Um, and think of it this way, like think of all the things we'll do to get another 10, 15% in sales. Like, you know, how many wholesale accounts, once you get up and running, would you need to get another 10, 15% in sales? Whereas here, you're just using the existing accounts you have and possibly even open up to new products that maybe wouldn't work in the U S but might work there because there's less competition or, you know, maybe that particular product people are willing to pay a little bit extra for because it's not available in Canada. So you're, there's, they're willing to pay a little bit of a premium. So, you know, I would say when you're looking at it, don't, don't look through the same lens that you look at it in the U S Really what you look at is, does that product or similar products sell in Canada? And even if it's 10, 15%, that's actually a good sign because you're just widening your net and you're increasing your snowball. So the money you make from profit from Canada, that could go into a new wholesale supplier. That could go into maybe you wanted to try some PPC marketing to you know, spike your algorithm here in the U.S., you can do a lot of those things or hire somebody for your team with the profits you make internationally. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's about what I've seen too, about 10% of the amount of sales in Canada anyways, mm -hmm. versus the US sales. That's really important to keep in mind. <laughs> Don't expect that you're gonna get the same amount of sales in Canada, um, but like you said, you know, how much would you do to try to increase your sales 10, 15% in the U S mm -hmm. uh, you can just send some uh, product across the border and increase it that way. Just as easy or probably easier. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, like for example, I had a Joe Valley from quiet light brokerage on my podcast. And one of the things he talked about is it's more attractive to a buyer. If you decide to sell your business one day, if you have more, marketplaces and you know having canada that is another marketplace even though it's another amazon marketplace it's another source of income so you're bringing in more profit you're making it more attractive and potentially you could be looking at higher multiples if you have a bunch of international sales um, channels as well so that way you're getting the value of your company on both the profit end and the multiple end which i know that's a whole other ball game to talk about uh, selling your business yeah, for sure. And something to think about too, obviously Canada is a smaller population than the U.S., but it's also those marketplaces are all newer than the U.S. marketplace. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, just imagine if we were able to be forward thinking enough that we got in this Amazon game and Amazon.com back mm -hmm. in like 2005 <laughs> or whatever when they first started, right? So this is an opportunity that we could potentially get into these marketplaces Maybe they're not selling as much right now, but they potentially mm -hmm. could sell a lot more in the future as Amazon just keeps continuing to seemingly take over the world here. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, everybody says, oh, I wish I was on Amazon way back when. Mm -hmm. Well, this is kind of your chance because like to your point, Amazon is always on the cutting edge and the, the biggest market share and everything of, you know, total sales in the whole country. Here in the U.S., but it's moving that way in other countries. So you, this is your chance to put your uh, your stake in the ground and say, "I'm I'm I'm here too." Yep, absolutely. All right, so let's jump over to Europe and let's try <laughs> to uh, keep this from the perspective of wholesale sellers. Sure. 
mostly are going to be buying and sourcing all their products in the United States. Um, so where do we start if we want to sell in Europe? Well, I would say the UK is probably the best place to start. Now, if the listing is already existing and it's translated in another marketplace, you could look into that. Now, the asterisk and everything I'm saying is we're recording this in early January, early to mid-January of uh, 2020. And the there's a hard Brexit, meaning the UK is leaving the European Union at the end of this month. Yeah, I literally was just about an hour and a half ago on the phone with my Avask, the company I use for that compliance in um, Europe. And she's like, I know as much as you know. <laughs> no one really knows what's going to happen. So how that affects trade arrangements and getting goods in between countries, we don't know. Right now, stuff can move around freely. Like you can have everything housed in the UK and you can sell it in Germany, you can sell it in Italy, you can sell it in Spain and France, but that might all change depending on what happens after Brexit. So everything I say, take with a little bit of a grain of salt that it might change. But here's the big thing in mind, or big thing to keep in mind is, you know, with every business, margins are very important. I know with wholesale, it's even more important. So one of the things to keep in mind is the sales tax there is called VAT. VAT is charged not on top of the selling price customarily, it's included in the, in the selling price. So you have to account for VAT. So in the UK, the standard VAT rate is 20%. So the way to walk through that math, because I know this is going to be very important for people listening, is let's say you're selling a product for 12 pounds. So that's their currency there. So you would think 20% would be 240, um, $2 and 40 cents or two pounds and 40 pence as they would call it there. Well, not exactly. The way it works is your selling price would actually be, even though the customer sees 12 pounds and they pay 12 pounds, it's technically the selling price, what they would call the VAT exclusive selling price would be 10 pounds and you would have two pounds of VAT. That's the way the standard scheme works. And then like in Canada, you're going to pay sometimes for things at the border, whatever the customary price is or whatever your, not customary price, whatever your, um, whatever, basically whatever your declared value is, which is what you paid for the goods, you're going to pay for that on top of that. And then that could be recoverable if you use a prep center off ask your prep center how they handle that because it's a very gray area with b2b so they might say okay here's our prices so you say oh okay they're going to charge me a one pound you know one sterling pound or you know what their currency per unit but they may actually have to be charging you that and they're going to charge you that on top of the selling price because even though i said on amazon.co.uk it's included in the selling price because to cons in consumers, that's the way it's done generally is it's included in the price. But B2B world, oftentimes, and it can go both ways, so always confirm this, they might charge you VAT on top of it. So that could make your pricing 20% more expensive. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of landmines and technically you're supposed to use this form and technically you're supposed to use this. So one of the things I've come to do is whatever VAT I have to pay, like to like a prep center or at the border or whatever, I just pay it and it's just part of my cost structure. Then in the UK, you can file for what's called the flat rate scheme, which is instead of 20%, it's 7.5%. Now there, it would be 7.5% of using my example from earlier of 12 pounds. So it'd be 7.5% of 12 pounds, not of 10, unfortunately. But it still works out to be, you end up paying in a lot of cases less in VAT. You may have to validate this because depending on how much you're paying for your products, it, this might not work for you. But if anything, it gives you simplicity because you don't have to have all the forms or worry about whatever it is, just whatever your sales were times flat rate amount, and that's what you pay. So that's what I like to do. 
um, just because it makes it way simpler and I don't have to worry about like, oh, technically they didn't send me the right form to be able to prove that I, um, you know, am eligible to recover what I paid at the border because there's sticklers about that in Europe. Um, so that's one of the things I would definitely keep in mind is just, again, for wholesale purposes, more than anything, it's going to be a little more complicated in Europe, going back to why I said it was varsity for uh, um, VAT, it's going to be a lot more complicated to figure out your margin structures to make sure it makes sense. And then also, if you're air shipping it from the US, that's going to cut into your margins as well. So you really got to make sure that you have your cost structure in line before you take a stab at it. That's what I would tell people for Europe. That's why so, I well, recommend starting in Canada. If I'm if I'm understanding right, so if I'm shipping, let's say ten thousand dollars worth of products from the U.S. Mm -hmm. to the U.K. to get it across the border into the U.K., you have to pay VAT on that ten thousand. Yes. Okay, so that VAT is on that ten thousand, and then I list the products on Amazon, and you pay VAT a second time. Well, technically, the way they're looking at is the customer is paying the VAT the second time. So think of it this way: let's say. It's $10,000 worth of product and you're selling it for the equivalent of $20,000. Mm -hmm. So you're going to pay that on the 10,000. And then when you collect from the customer, you're of the 20,000 you collect. And so maybe you really should be charging 24,000 for that stuff to make your margins work. Got it. So okay. you really want to be very careful with, how you're pricing things there like i wouldn't just take whatever your price is in the u.s and if let's say one dollar in the u.s is just hypothetically 0.75 british pounds don't just use that calculation and just say i'm just going to go with that and make it simple yeah i would go through every step of the process to figure out what your margins actually are because that's where you can get in trouble yeah. is with what that might cost you yeah, you have to know all those expenses, every little one. That's why I have, for each one of my products, I have it calculated down to the penny, you know, mm -hmm. how much the import duty is, how much the clearance fee is, and shipping per pound and everything mm -hmm. else. So I know exactly how much I'm paying because you got to make sure you're making money, obviously. That's why we're doing this. So, Right, we're not just doing this to give uh, Amazon fulfillment fees. Exactly. So, all right. So that's really important to know. So the 20% VAT going into the UK, that's basically like the import duty from Canada. Or are you pay yes. import duty on top of the VAT as well? Generally, in both cases, you have an import duty as well. But the import duty is generally much smaller than the GST or the VAT. Okay. All right. And that all depends right. on your product and the codes and all that. All right, so basically in general, whatever products we're sending over, they're probably going to be relatively selling higher price than what we're selling them in the U.S. because of those, the added shipping charges, the added VAT when bringing it into the country, and then you add the duty on top of that. Um, and then, of course, the second VAT, which the customer is paying, but that we have to include in the cost that we're paying or we're charging the customer. Yes. So here's, and just to take a step back on, you know, what paying paid and VAT and how that all structures. So whatever the customer pays, that's included in your selling price. You're going to owe that to the government, whether it's you're the flat rate scheme or standard scheme. If you're on the standard scheme, meaning you're not on the flat rate scheme, whatever you paid in what you paid into the system, basically as a customer. So think of yourself as a customer at the border and a customer with the prep center, whatever VAT you paid, you'll subtract from what you owe the government. Yep. That's the way to think of it. So oh, okay. what I would- You don't pay it twice. What you paid at the border, you subtract from what you pay in the end. Yes. Got so it. that's why it might make sense to say, okay, does the flat rate scheme make sense to me or not? So yep. maybe it does for you to say, okay, this is what I'm collecting from customers, basically one sixth of my selling price, or you know, then I take it and subtract out what I've, are what I have paid into the system, so to speak, for VAT at the border and at 
you know, prep centers or if I have any other services I have in the UK, subtract that out and now, okay, there, let's see if that makes sense. If, which is better for me, that rate that I just gave an example of, or the flat rate where I only just say seven and a half percent. Okay. Now you don't recover in the seven and a half percent because the flat rate scheme is just to assume it's all kind of lumped in there. And the nice thing is with the flat rate scheme is your first year, you actually can take off another percent. You actually only paying six and a half percent. All right. And do you have to decide for that flat rate scheme up front or can you wait until it's time to file and pay, determine which way would be cheapest and do that way? Or do you have to decide up front? Well, good question. So generally, I'm almost positive you have to do it up front. Okay. And the reason I say that is I accidentally filed myself on the flat rate scheme. And then for several years, I was using the standard scheme. But because I DIY'd it and I didn't know what I was doing at the time, I just picked it what's called an SIC code and an industry code, and I picked the wrong one. And so what ended up happening is, even though I never used that scheme, um, my accountant at Avask pointed out, like, oh, well, if you're on the flat rate scheme, you should actually have been on the 7.5%. So I called HMRC, their version of the IRS and they backdated my industry code to the right one. So I was only paying seven and a half percent. Um, and then actually ended up getting a refund from them for all the extra money I'd spent them. So in my case, it made sense to do the flat rate scheme, but here's what I'll say is you can go on the flat rate scheme and you can come off it, but to be eligible, you can, um, you, I don't remember the exact details, but it, within a certain time period, you couldn't have gone off the flat rate scheme and then go back on. Okay. All right. Perfect. And how often are you paying your taxes? Do you have to oh, pay annually or quarterly? Monthly? Quarterly? Quarterly? In, okay. in, in UK, it's quarterly. Okay. Perfect. So, all right. So we have our product shipped over into the UK into a prep center. So it sounds mm -hmm. like we definitely want to have a prep center in the UK. Yes. You, I mean, if it makes sense and you can send it straight into Amazon, you could do that too. I personally use a prep center. Okay. Yeah. I definitely think it would probably be easier, but up to everybody. All right. right. So now what, well, once we get it into the prep center, uh, where are we going from there? Are we, the, we created the listing on Amazon mm -hmm. UK and the prep center sends it into whatever Amazon warehouse and I think there's some, some way to send it around to different countries as well, correct? Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. So currently, there's what's called the Pan-European program. And they will, you can save, it's about a euro per fulfillment fee when you ship out to a customer outside of the, the UK. Because the way that works is in my non-tax professional understanding, but what I've pretty much come to learn, this is how it works, is when you ship into a country and you live outside of that country, um, if you're from outside of Europe, I should say, you're required to register and file in that country. If you store goods in that country, you're supposed to register and file. Now, here's one of the things about Europe, the way it stands pre-Brexit right now. In the US, we're so used to everything's destination based. So it's not where the goods are shipped from, it's where the customer lives. In Europe, it's the opposite. It's where the goods are being, what they would say, dispatched from. So if it's being dispatched from Amazon's warehouse in the UK to a customer in Germany, you owe VAT on that sale in Germany to the UK government. Now, that might change after Brexit. It might not, we'll see. But that's basically how it works. Now, Amazon wants to be able to move stuff around. Like here in the US, let's say you ship stuff into Charlotte, they might put some of that in Michigan, put some of it in California, some in Texas. They'll just move it around however they want because they want to get it fastest to the customer and their algorithm can kind of figure that out. Well, in Europe, they can only do that if you click a box saying you accept pan-European. So Yes, you save a euro per unit. However, you now are responsible for that, not just in the five countries Amazon has marketplaces, 
but also the Czech Republic and Poland, where they will also store goods from. So it might be the equivalent of eight, nine thousand dollars US to do all the filings and all the registrations. And you know how it's like super simple. We talked about the register in Canada. It's they're not quite as friendly in the UK, but you know, they just sound so intelligent um, with their <laughs> yeah. British accents when yeah. you call. The accent. Yeah, the accent definitely makes them sound so smart. Um, but you you start calling, you know, the tax office in Italy, you have no idea what they're saying. There may not be they're anyone who speaks yeah. English. The they're form language. you try to look at the form in the Czech Republic, like the letters aren't even the same as like our letters. Yeah. So you end up having to use another company and it's it's very convoluted to figure out which country gets figured out. So you just you kind of have to let the tax experts take care of it. And so if you think about it outside of the UK, you would need to have seven, eight thousand sales a year just to make that worthwhile just for what you're paying in tax compliance for compared with the savings. And then you're gonna end up paying like some countries are monthly. So like, I remember I did pan European for a year and I came right off of it more just because I wanted to learn what it was like, but it was like I paying like the Czech Republic, the equivalent of like $8 each month because I had a couple orders mm -hmm. shipped from their warehouses. And it's like, nice. this is nonsense. This is just a waste of time. And then the, even having a VASC do the forms for me, like Spain, like I had to have, go to a consulate to do something. So I'd pay them extra. So they go to the consulate on my behalf. And then it was like, I had to have some form apostolized. I didn't even know what it meant to apostle a document until I did that. But it's like, basically the state of Florida had to like provide a certificate to prove the notary is a real person, which is like, this is weird. So yeah, it's like, it's more work than I thought it was worth. So I would highly recommend against it. So if we end up in a situation where there's a hard Brexit and nothing can leave the UK, well, just make Germany your house of operations because yeah. there the VAT rate's the lowest. There'll be the something that, that comes out of that. Amazon will figure that out for sure. And even if we do oh, have yeah. Brexit, um, which is interesting, all of that, uh, you know, I don't want to dive into all that, but you know, oh, UK is the second largest economy, I believe, in the uh, European Union. Uh, Germany is the largest. Mm -hmm. um, so even if UK leaves and there isn't anything set up between all those other states, I was just looking it up. So the United States population is currently about 330 million. Uh -huh. Canada is about 37 million. Uh -huh. About the size about of 10 California. Of the, about 10% uh -huh. of the sales. UK is about 63 million. Um, mm -hmm. So you could still probably expect about 20% of the sales in the US into the UK, even if everything else gets cut off. So mm -hmm. it probably would still be a good market. They speak English. Everything is set up pretty easily to flow into the UK. And I can't imagine that something won't be worked out uh, with the UK and the European Union, considering that UK is the, the second largest economy in the area. Yeah, I mean, we could be eating crow. I agree with you. Um, we both could be eating a lot of crow here in a few weeks, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, they've had hard Brexits for three years, and the, the can keeps getting kicked down the road. Now, this one's supposed to be like, this one's actually happening because there's a new government in place that wasn't in place in the previous uh, deadline dates, but we'll see. Yep. Yep. It's interesting. It makes me think of uh, uh, when the United States uh, left Britain. You know, we basically had. Oh, yeah. Now it's going full circle. <laughs> we left Britain, and now Britain's trying to get out of the European Union. So that's kind of yeah. funny how that goes. But right. Um, all right. So, what else should we know? Anything else that we should touch on before we wrap up here in Europe? Yeah, one of the things to keep in mind is in Canada, you're going to have less sales than you'll probably have in the UK. But in Europe, generally speaking, you can't, I won't say can't, the market tends to be in a situation where you're not going to recoup all of your VAT costs. So you end up having lower margins in Europe, but higher sales. 
in Canada, you tend to have higher margins, but lower sales than you would in Europe. It depends on the products you're selling and things of that nature. But, you know, as a general rule of thumb, it's something to keep in mind. Because also with Canada, even though Canada is such an enormous country, most people live within 100 miles of the border. And most of them are in either expensive cities like Toronto and Vancouver, which are like San Francisco or New York, basically, is, you know, cost of living. And then they, a lot of people just live out in the boondocks and there's like a general store an hour away that's like the size of a 7-Eleven or they can just go on their phone and have Amazon bring them stuff. So they are willing to pay a little extra for that. Yeah. So, so let me understand that correctly. So are you saying that in Europe, as it stands mm -hmm. right now, using the pan EU, is it called, right? Being able to yeah, so pan-European versus European fulfillment network. So pan EU is where they move stuff everywhere. Europe we can expect to actually sell a higher the lot or higher quantity of product versus the U S no, sorry. Versus Canada okay. versus Canada. Yeah. That's just in case, in case I wasn't clear there match the U S even though you're selling into lots of different. Correct. Products. You'll almost, I'll, I'll just, I could be wrong, but generally speaking, unless you know you have a, a product that's just not doing so well in the U.S., that's just gangbusters outside of the U.S., you probably combined, you know, might see thirty percent in Europe and Canada and be happy with that. But think about that: what else would you do to get thirty percent more sales? Yep, it's pretty simple. And it's not new accounts. No, it's less risky. On the wholesale side too. So not only. If we go into Canada and UK, not only can we sell the products that we're currently selling in the US, possibly, you're going to want to make mm -hmm. sure with the suppliers that they allow you to exactly. sell in other countries, because not all products can be sold in other countries. So we're going to want to check on that, especially anything you consume, put in your mm -hmm. body, that kind of stuff. There's going to be more. Oh, yeah. But now that we're open up in those different countries, the European Union and Canada, we can start finding suppliers in those countries and mm -hmm. sell their products. So there's plenty of companies that make products in Canada. I actually import some products from Canada into the U.S. to sell. Mm. Um, so now that opens up more markets to be able to find products from Canada, from the U.K., from Germany, that now you can open up accounts there, sell their products in those marketplaces as well, and maybe eventually import those into the U.S. even. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm very new to this wholesale game. I'm just now like starting to say, okay, I'm about to dip my toe in. But knowing what I know, which is very limited, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I would imagine if I'm calling a supplier and I'm saying, hey, I'm going to sell your product in the U.S. versus, hey, I'm going to sell your product in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, which is more attractive and at least going to get their attention to continue the conversation? Yep. For sure. It's definitely something that you'll be able to use. And maybe they say no in the U.S., mm -hmm. but then you can say, well, we also sell in Canada and the U.K., mm -hmm. and they might allow you to get in the door selling in those platforms. Mm -hmm. And then down the road, maybe you can jump into the U.S. market or something like that. So, yeah, it definitely mm -hmm. would be something that you can hang out there as a carrot, so to speak, and maybe uh, get some more suppliers to allow you to open accounts for sure. Plus yeah. you look like more of a legitimate business, right? Because that's a lot of the downside of Amazon wholesale sellers is that they are, a lot of times they don't treat it like a real business. And mm. that's why companies get so sick of them and just say no Amazon sellers. Um, so the more you act and look and represent yourself like a real business, the more likely you're going to be able to get those accounts open. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we are a little bit over the hour mark. So it's a good discussion. You, you put it was fantastic. A lot of great stuff here for sure. I'm going to have to listen to this one again. Here. <laughs> um, but you put together a checklist for us that is going to help people get into the markets. Uh, tell us a little bit about what we're going to see on there. 
Yeah, absolutely. So what ends up happening is I'm sure people that are that have made it all the way through. So if you're listening to this right now, you made it all the way through. I want to congratulate you for that. But you probably feel like you're just drinking from the fire hose. Like, what, that GST, Canada, what, 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 what? It's hard to follow all this. Well, put together a, a checklist, which is really more of a mini guide. It's like 16 pages where it walks you through step by step what you need to do to grow your own international empire so that you can get these you know sales numbers that we're talking about in other countries you know it's one of those things we can't guarantee what your sales are going to look like but we can guarantee what they won't look like if you don't so if you're willing to do the things other people won't do you're going to have results other people can't have so if you go to maximizing ecommerce.com forward slash todd um t-o-d-d i have a checklist that you can download absolutely for free it'll walk you through all this stuff and uh if, if I can shorten the cycle for you and make it simpler, then it's a win for me. So for sure. And I'll be downloading that myself and I'll put the links in the show notes. So again, that was entrepreneuradventure.com forward slash seven for this episode. Mm -hmm. um, if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be down in the description as well. Um, so I will be definitely picking that up. And then Kevin, you also, what if they want more help? from you on going into these other markets you offer that service as well right i do actually and here's what i'll do for your uh for your listeners if they download the checklist and they want to set up a free 30-minute strategy session i'll be more than happy to do so so i'll make it so that on the uh, uh the thank you page um they can click a button to schedule something uh as long as they have a business that started so if you're thinking about getting started get started in the u.s first before you start worrying about international marketplaces but if you got a foothold in the US and the private label game, I had one product for sale and four that were coming in the pipeline when I got into Canada. So I think you can start relatively early, but as long as they're at least started selling in the US and they are saying, okay, I want to at least consider this, you know, I'd be more than happy to jump on a half hour call or either myself or someone on my team. Um, to at least go through and answer whatever questions they may have. And you know, I'd love to see them have a win in you know, expanding their business with a wider net. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's appreciate appreciate that. So yeah, definitely head on over to maximizingecommerce.com forward slash Todd, T-O-D-D, -D, download that checklist and schedule your call. Um, other than that, Kevin, it's been awesome having you on. I've learned a lot. Like I said, I'm probably going to have to listen to this one again because I want to go more into Canada and eventually into the UK as well. So maybe I'll even take you up on that 30 minute call at some point as well. But absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on and taking the time to uh, let us know how to sell internationally. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. All right, what did I tell you? That was an excellent episode. In fact, this is one that I am definitely gonna have to listen to again because I am going into Canada, like I said earlier, and looking to go into the UK sooner rather than later. So definitely download that checklist that Kevin made for us. You can get that at maximizingecommerce.com forward slash Todd, T-O-D-D, or you can pick it up in the show notes entrepreneuradventure.com forward slash seven and you can download it there along with see the transcript and the show notes and other links for this episode that you're definitely going to want to check out yeah i really hope you enjoyed it i know i enjoyed sitting down with kevin sanderson and appreciate his time so with that we'll finish up this episode this is todd with entrepreneur adventure signing off happy selling everybody this has been another episode of the Entrepreneur Adventure Podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow entrepreneur. And always remember, success is yours if you take it.